Good afternoon and welcome to the Carolan Cymru revision. This is week two of the revision sessions for the AS Media Studies. Today we're going to be looking at the news online. My name is Miss Hales and I'm going to be presenting the session today. If you want to ask any questions, jot them down and join us for the live session in a couple of weeks where you'll be able to talk um, in directly to me and ask any of the questions that you've got. We should be about 45 minutes today, but obviously we're going to record the session. So if you feel you miss anything, go back and watch the session again. Also, feel free to pause and consider some of the questions or uh, prompts that are being given to you as we go through the lesson. We're going to go through the different sections of Unit 1 today, talking through the questions and looking at ways to respond to them. Also looking at the theory and the practicalities behind what you're being expected to do in the exam. So I'm hoping that by the end of today's session, you will be confident about approaching the news in the line, news in the online age section, that you'll be able to find answers for the questions and be able to structure your answer. And I'm hoping that you're going to be familiar with the mark scheme and the success criteria. So first of all, let's have a think about what the paper is going to look like. Obviously, it's the unit one paper. And we're going to look at the section B today. Uh, next week, we'll look at section C, which is film in uh, Wales and Hollywood. Last week, we looked at the um, selling images section. You need to make sure you've got plenty of black pens. And obviously, if you like highlighters uh, for annotation, bring those as well. In this exam section, you will need to know a few key news stories. You'll need to be able to refer to examples as um, you're writing your answer. So remember that you're going to refer to different types of news products. So you need to have stories from the newspapers, from the radio and from your online um, set text as well. The exam is two and a half hours long, you know this, you've got three sections um, and obviously in the news and the film sections, you should be spending about 40 minutes writing up your answer. The exam gives you some information on the front cover, so make sure that you're familiar with how many marks um, are given per question that you're examining. Make sure that you refer to your set text so that you show that breadth of understanding. Make sure you use the subject specific terminology where appropriate, link it in where it's relevant and make sure you bring in relevant theories. Please note that word relevant, it needs to be linked to what you're saying. So over your course, you may not have studied news in the online age yet, but when you do, you're going to study both a traditional print product alongside websites and radio news online. You need to be familiar with the codes and conventions of all of those, both the print, the website and the radio, so that you are confident in analysing how the story is being presented in those different mediums. So these are the um, criteria from the specification. You've got three different groups and you study one option from each of those groups. Your teacher will talk to you about this and guide you in what you're doing. In the exam, then, you need to be able to refer to these and be able to back up your points by referring to specific examples from them. As well as this, you're going to study one significant event and you're going to look at how that event unfolds, how it's represented and disseminated across the different media that you're studying. So you will look at a story that rolls out across the newspaper and the website and the radio news. It'll be a hard news item, so it'll be politics or crime, foreign affairs or the economy. Um, examples of some of the ones that we've studied in the past with the um, riots in America, the Trump riots in America a couple of years ago. Obviously, we looked at the COVID pandemic when that was rolling out. We looked at um, Johnson when he resigned. We looked at Truss when she resigned. So significant stories, stories which hit the news and which carry on for a few days, which roll across. You're also going to study the nature of um, audiences, the way in which they interact with that news, looking at how they uh, consume and interact with it, but looking at the same news story and how that might uh, reach different audiences. We also look at digital media as well, social media, sites including Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. 
OK, so you'll be familiar with the um, framework that you're using. This particular section, the new section, looks at all four aspects of the conceptual framework. So you need to study the media language, the industry, the audience and the representations when you're studying the news. And so you're looking at things like how the media language codes and conventions create meaning, looking at how a newspaper front cover uses a headline to attract attention, looking at the images and how they draw attention to the specific story that's being presented. You will also look at the industry and how the news is shaped by who owns it, who produces it, who distributes it. You also start to look at the representations and how the news represents the different events, issues, places, social cultural groups. You also will examine the audience and how they respond and interact with the uh, news, both in print format and online. You also have certain key um, theorists that you need to study. So for media language, you're looking at semiotics, so you're looking at uh, Barts, you're looking at what is being signified, you're looking at the connotations of certain details, um, you're looking at the representations, you're, so you're looking at hall, um, including representations of ethnicity. And for audiences, you're going to be familiar with Gerbner, Hall, and Clay Shirky. So when we're thinking about the news, one of the first things to consider is what actually makes the news. So this is where I possibly pause, maybe think about what's made the news recently. Why do you think those stories have made the news and what makes them newsworthy? And what news values do they have, which means that they've been reported on? So if you pause here and consider some key news stories, you can then examine the news values of them once you've got your ideas. So there are 12 news values that we usually use when we're looking at the news. A story is going to be selected and it's going to hit the front page or it's going to make it into the news program if it's a long running event. So it's frequency. So you consider the frequency of it. Is it happening regularly? So something like the Olympics, when it's going across a few weeks, you're going to be studying that. You're going to be examining the frequency of it and it will appear quite regularly in the news. Is something planned or anticipated? So we're studying the sort of predictability of an event. So you might look at a coronation or you might look at um, a specific news uh, music festival as that plans out. Is it a big event? So the size and the scale of the event is also going to mean that it's newsworthy. So something like Glastonbury, a big planned event which um, attracts a huge audience is going to be on the news somehow. Some aspect of that is going to be on the news. People will select a news story if it's relevant to Britain or if it involves British people. So you talk about the closeness of the story. Is it something which is relatable for the British um, when they're reading it or watching it? Is it popular or in demand? Is there a demand for certain news about a certain topic? Is it something which has been going on for a long time, so continuity? Is it an unexpected or rare event which perhaps might get into the news because you've got nothing um, which is something which is unusual? You also might think about something which is elite nations or elite people, so something which involves America, something which involves China might be considered. Um, you might think about whether it's a human interest story. Is it going to evoke sympathy or judgment? Um, do we have something which is going to make us want to watch it because we're going to empathise with them or engage with them? We also find that a lot of the news is tragic or bad news. Negativity makes it into the news. OK, so this is another activity that you can do. These are some of the key terms for the newspaper, for print media. So I would pause it here and I would try and match up the term to the definition. Once you've done that, play the video again so that you'll be able to see if you've got the right answer. So here come the answers. So this is now matched up for you. So you've got the key terms such as the masthead, which is obviously that distinctive bit that goes at the top that gives you the name of the newspaper. You've got the headline, which is the big 
print, which gives you the key idea of the story. It sums up the story for you, draws your attention to it. You've got the caption, which is the little bit of information that goes underneath the picture, which anchors the meaning of the picture. It allows us to read that picture in the way that the news producer wants us to read it. So look over those terms, make sure you're familiar with them, and then make sure that you can match them onto a newspaper front cover. So on the next page, I've matched them up to a cover from the Observer. Obviously, you could print off your own front cover and try and match them up as well. So here is the, uh, the terms or here are the terms in their practical application where they belong on the newspaper front cover. If you also want to check out the news websites, what you will find is there's often a section there which has got pupil resources and educational resources on it. They can be really useful. Um, the Guardian Foundation, for example, has some really good worksheets which cover um, the sort of significance of the news from their point of view, shows you how they choose it and select it, gives you some of the terminology they use. So it's well worth having a look at. Um, this is an example of a front cover with somebody's notation on it for you. So ways that we're going to examine the news and break it down. So being able to do this is a really good skill. Um, and then obviously you have to think about how that appeals to an audience, how it draws attention, what sort of um, bias is there in the story, that sort of thing. So being able to deconstruct and look at a front page is going to be a useful skill for you. Moving from the print based media and print based news into the social media, it's interesting to consider how many people now engage with the news through um, various social media platforms. <clears throat> and it's something that you really need to be considering for this exam. It's worth looking up an old article from The Independent. It was published in 2014, but it was looking at how online news could change the way we interact and engage. So I've given you the headline there and it's well worth looking at it and considering the key points being made. But what you're trying to think about is how has the social media changed the way in which we interact and engage with the news? So it was worth thinking about some of the characteristics of news websites. So with a news website, you've got 24 seven updated coverage. So as soon as a story is breaking, you've got that on the internet. As soon as there is um, a new outcome in a story, it's on the internet. So they are constantly updating and um, refreshing the news feed. And you can always find that at the top of the page. There are other articles as you go through the page. But when you go onto a news website, the first thing you see is the most up to date version of the story that they are running. They also use uh, search engine optimization, which increases the visibility and reach because they use certain key terms um, so that when you search something on the Internet, up comes their website and up comes their story. News websites will often use a mix of free and premium content showing this shift to digital revenue so that they are making their money through the website by charging for certain features. Not everybody will pay, but some people will. And if you look at some of the news websites, they often give you a certain number of articles for free and then they'll ask if you wish to make a contribution to the running of the site. There will also be lots of interactive elements on um, on a news website, which is one of the reasons why people start to switch the way in which they engage with the news. Because when you go online, all of a sudden you are able to personalize the content based on your own preferences and you can uh, see things that you want to see. It might mean you miss out on things because all of a sudden you start to get news stories about the things that you've clicked on before and you may not see newer stuff, but it's, it helps you to personalize what you're doing. You're also able to share the story is much easier and you're also able to comment on those stories a lot easier. So in contemporary society, a news website is becoming one of the primary sources of information, especially for world events, because we are able to access this information so much easier, so much quicker. And it shapes our perceptions of the world, especially if we're seeing um, violent acts or if we're seeing acts of terrorism in certain countries or war it can start to shape the way we perceive the world around us. 
there is this global dissemination of news now, meaning that we're far more informed as a society and we start to see these more democratic ideals, hopefully. The speed and competitiveness of a, a news website, though, can sometimes lead to the spread of misinformation or unchecked facts because they're putting out the news so quickly. Sometimes some of the stories aren't as well checked as they might be. So this is where we start to talk about reliability, where we start to talk about bias, where we start to talk about how the news is selected and looking at how perhaps the story is covered in different forms. <clears throat> A news website will give you instant gratification because you've got this constant connectivity. You can check something, you can immediately find a story related to it. You hear something on um, the grapevine, you want to check it out, you can do it on your phone straight away. Um, in a break time when you've got five minutes, you can have a quick look and you can find out the latest information that's going on around you in your local area, in your country or even across the world. So there's this instant knowledge that's at your fingertips now. And it really has transformed people's reading habits and it's boosted news rather than killed off the news. So this is where, again, you could pause now and consider, you could consider the website here of First News Live and you could consider how this is engaging the audience and how it's um, encouraging users to interact. So you could perhaps pause it here, have a think about the um, way in which this is appealing and interacting with this audience. Here you've got some useful website codes and conventions, so you've got some useful terms for them. Things that you're probably familiar with from other subjects, not just from media. <clears throat> and on this one, if you um, paused it, you could fit those terms now into um, the online web page. So you could think about where they fitted and you could fit those in. And there are the answers for you. So you now get the answers for that previous exercise. So thinking about the terminology, thinking about, again, what purpose does it serve? What is the main role of that particular feature and why do they include it? What is it? Is it for ease of access? Is it to engage an audience? Is it to personalise the content? Is it to encourage you to go deeper into the website? So there's all sorts of reasons why these features would be there. OK, moving on from online news into the radio news. So remember, you've got to study three different formats. So we've looked at print, we've looked at online, and now we're looking at the radio news. Again, you've got some key terms here, just some very basic terms about the way in which a programme might be structured and put together. One of the websites that I sometimes encourage people to go to is the BBC Bite Size page. There's some really useful GCSE revision notes there for journalism and radio. It would be worth looking at some of the terminology on there. Not all of it's going to be necessary, but it's just a useful standpoint again for you to start with. OK, so thinking about the codes and conventions of a radio programme. You may have studied BBC uh, Radio One. You may have studied um, the Wales radio programme. So you may have studied the Gareth Lewis show. Whatever you've studied, you've probably discovered that there is a very distinct brand identity to radio programming, that the um, channel and the producers have worked very hard to create this brand identity. And there are familiar jingles. There are repeated slogans, perhaps regular presenters whose names are associated with that programme. And obviously you've got the regular time for those specific programmes as well. So there's, there's a regularity to it, a familiarity to it. And they work hard to identify their brand so that you know who you're listening to and what programme it is. What you will find with radio is that there are local and regional programmes with presenters using regional accents. This is becoming much more commonplace now. Accents are becoming acceptable on the news and it is... Um, sometimes a sign of pride in the regional identity in order to use a presenter with that accent. You get familiar time slots for specific programmes and so you've got things like the breakfast or drive time, both of which are aimed at commuters, people who are travelling to work and therefore they cover the things like the news, the um, travel, they do the weather. And it allows those people who are travelling to work to listen to that and get es essential information for the day. So they're quite useful programmes. Programmes are often available on demand as well as live. So you can listen back to a favourite show um, 
and you can access it after the original broadcast because often archived for you. You will get news headlines from your local area as well as from the rest of the world. So depending on what's breaking that day, you'll get a roundup of the national and the regional and the international news. There's regular times for the news bulletins. So within the, the programme, there will be a regular time that they will hear the news, a regular time that you will hear the weather, a regular time that you'll hear the traffic and the sports news as well, of course. There will be discussion slots within the programme relating to the news and the issues of the day, as well as interviews with experts and ordinary people who were caught up in the story. And of course, there are sports um, bulletins as well. So those are the things that you are looking for when you listen to the programme and you're looking for those familiar codes and conventions for a radio programme. We've just talked a little about the radio news, having a presenter who is a familiar face and they are often a very important part of that programme's identity. So check out the WJC resources, looking at who the presenter is and think about the role that they play in a news programme. And one of the things to consider with your set text, <clears throat> is your presenter local? Does your presenter speak with an accent? Is their personality obvious as, as the programme develops? Do they engage well with the other team members? I mean, one of the things you will often find is that although the presenter is an individual, they will often have a team of people working with them and there is a lot of interaction between them. So there's a lot of uh, humour within the programme, a lot of quite light-hearted discussion about some of the things that they're presenting on. It creates this nice familiar feel as if you're listening in on a conversation between friends. <clears throat> so when you're looking at a news programme, one of the things to consider is the bias. and you're often needing to examine whether the article is biased, whether the presentation of the news is biased, but you um, need to consider that. Not all of the bias is deliberate, but obviously there will be bias through the selection or the omission of what goes into the programme. There will be bias through the placement of something on a news website. There might be bias through the headline, sort of positioning you as an audience, given the emotive language that they're using or the um, loaded terminology that they're using. You might have bias through the photographs or the captions which anchor the meaning and position you to read it in a certain way. Or even the camera angle can help to create a biased feel to a story. There might be a bias through use of names or titles. There might be bias through the statistics that they choose to include or the count of the crowd. Um, it would be worth looking at the um, elections in America to consider this when they were trying to com compare the crowds at Barack's um, inauguration compared to the crowds at Trump's or inauguration. If you look at the sort of controversy at the time, um, there were definite biases within the way in which those crowds were being counted. Um, so it's definitely worth having a look at it. And I would be considering how each of those work, and maybe thinking about something you've seen recently in the news um, and trying to consider whether there might be a form of bias within it. So just as a handy tip for the exam here, it's always a good idea to draw comparisons about how the stories are presented on different platforms. So perhaps considering um, what stories have made it into the news and whether they're in all the formats that you're studying, whether they made it into all your set texts. You might want to consider the view of the mainstream media compared to the um, perhaps the Huff Post, if that's what you've studied. So looking at the difference between the two of them, maybe looking at how local media covers it compared to how um, national media covers it. Maybe thinking about whether they're offering a balanced view or whether all the sources are biased in some way and how are they biased or why are they biased. You might then want to look at maybe what's covered on the radio that is or isn't covered elsewhere. And then obviously what does that tell you about the current focus, um, what society is interesting at the moment, what communities are looking for in the news that they're being presented with. So it's definitely worth drawing those comparisons, examining the way in which that news is presented across all the formats that you're studying. We're moving now into the theory. And um, one of the things that you've got to be able to look at is the audience theory. So what you've got here is a very quick reminder of the uses and gratification theory. And 
considering why an audience might engage with a certain form of media. So you're thinking about whether they get pleasure from it, whether they can work out something about their identity, whether they are getting something from their community, or whether they're building up their knowledge. So it's quite a useful acronym there to help you think about the uses and gratification in terms of why does an audience engage with a specific form of media? What do they get from it? You've also got some audience theory here with Hall, where you're looking at those preferred negotiated or oppositional readings, where you're considering how an audience might take on board the messages being presented by the media and whether they're going to find their own way into it, negotiate their way into it, whether they're going to oppose the hegemonic messages being presented to them. You've also got Gerbner cons to consider when you're looking at audience. Um, and of course, Gerbner is the one who talks about how long term exposure to patterns of representation might have a significant impact on the way that an individual views the world. Now, an easy example of this is perhaps that the increased focus in the crime in the news might mean that society feels that there's more crime around. Repeated stories about violence or murder mean that obviously people are going to feel unsafe in their communities. So that repeated exposure to a pattern of representation is going to mean that people associate certain aspects of crime within their community and start to get more concerned about it, more worried about it. So Gerbner is a really useful one when you're looking at uh, news in the media as well. Um, you also have to consider representation. So you've had audience theory, you've also got representation theory. So obviously Gerbner talks about the patterns of repeated exposure to representations and Hall talks about how those representations are constructed and how we might respond to them. So in terms of relating it to the news, you might want to think about the stereotypes or the representations that are often used by news um, presenters or, or news producers. Are teenagers always being presented as yobs in the media? Are they always being presented as unruly, out of control? Or are there more positive um, elements of um, teenagers being presented within the news? So thinking about the shorthand forms that the, the news might use to present and represent these groups of people and considering how they are presented in the news. OK, so that would be the theory. And then one other aspect of the theory is um, industry. So within the news online, um, sorry, within the news section, you are being asked to consider the industry behind the news. So who controls or runs the company that produces the news that you're looking at? How is that news produced and distributed? Are you aware of how that news is circulated and who has access to it and how they access it? And are you aware of profit and cost? Are you aware of how much a company is making and how much a company is spending on producing the news? So that industry awareness should be shaping the way in which you're interacting with the news and perhaps deconstructing it when you're looking at it in the exam. So what we've got here is a past paper question. This is from 2018 and this is from the section B. Now you'll notice you've got two parts to the question. You've got 2A which is worth 10 marks and you've got 2B which is worth 20 marks. Both parts of the question need to be addressed, both parts need to be um, answered in some detail. Obviously a 10 mark question you're going to write less than a 20 mark question. Those are the sorts of things you should be considering when you look at the marks available. So the first question says explain how recent technological developments have changed the way news is distributed. So this is looking at the way in which people access the news, how they read their news stories and how they interact with that news. And then the second question is asking you to look at how one event has been represented against across the two news media products that you've studied. So let's break this down a little bit more. So in the exam, you definitely need to spend some time planning and you should be planning and jotting down ideas before you start. Therefore, how has technology changed the way news is distributed? You know, pause now, jot down six or seven points and then obviously think about your set texts and consider whether you've got any relevant examples to offer there. 
this is the mark scheme that you would use for that question. So if you wanted to pause now and have a go at that question, in um, the next few slides, we're going to go over what you could have included and what somebody else has done for it. So we'll look at a, a, an example of an answer. So this is the mark scheme for that first question. The examiner would expect you to show some awareness of key theories and how the audiences interact with the media and news. So they would look for knowledge about different platforms and they'd be looking for you to be aware of um, the different ways in which the audiences consume the news. You might be able to look at brands. You might be able to look at digital versus print media. You might be able to look at use on mobile devices. Maybe look at the interaction between the reader and the news, the fact that we can now comment on the news stories. It's not a long answer, and so maybe 10 sensible analysed points um, looking at about a side of A4, but you know how much you write and your teacher will have given you a guide to how much you need to write for 10 marks. So if we have a look at this example, this is the start of a pupil answer for that. The fact that uh, many people especially young people, will access the news online on social media or on newspaper websites. The younger audiences are deciding to turn away from print newspapers to newspapers online. This is happening because it is easier to get news that's tailored for your news online than it is in a print newspaper. And then the candidate's gone on to talk about maybe having access to the news that you want, being able to tailor it to your own um, choices, and maybe thinking about um, the types of news that an audience would want to have. So this is the start of their answer. So it is only the opening paragraph. What do they do well? Well, they have considered the impact of technology on the audience. They've definitely addressed the question. They've got audience in there. But what haven't they done? They haven't really started to look at theoretical approaches yet. Um, and I know that this answer didn't go on to do theoretical approaches, so this is the thing that they did miss out. So perhaps thinking about what theories you can now bring in that are relevant to that analysis that you can add it in. OK, so the second question was asking you to consider a news event and examine the way that it was presented in two of your set texts. So the examiner expects you to analyse in a bit more detail because it's worth 20 marks this time. So it's double what you've done already. Looking at how that media language constructs the representation of an event, analysing the media language, including a range of aspects, which would look at things like the codes and conventions of newspapers or the codes and conventions of a website. Depending on what you've chosen to look at, obviously you're going to fit your answer around it. You need to perhaps look at how the representations have been constructed and you might want to refer to critical critical perspectives such as semiotics or perhaps looking at the representations depending on what you've chosen. So this is the longer answer. So you need to be really thinking about developing given examples, backing up your points of view. So again, I've got um, two paragraphs from a pupil response. So what I would do is I'd have a look at this, I'd consider what they've done well, I'd consider what could have been improved. So if you want to pause there, you could do that for yourselves. Obviously, the next slide I've got for you is going to give you my thoughts on it. And so when I was looking at this, I thought they um, had good reference to both print and radio. What they didn't do, unfortunately, was identify the radio program. And I think that's always a good idea. Identify your set text, say where you've got your information from, um, maybe even explain when it was um, broadcast or printed so that you've got this specific frame of reference within it. This candidate mentioned technical codes. They talked about technical codes and conventions, but unfortunately they just mentioned it in passing. They didn't actually say anything about the technical codes and conventions and they certainly didn't start looking at how print and the radio were different. Um, they did look at language and they did look at connotations. They did spend a little bit of time considering how um, the language was positioned in the audience and they were looking at the effect of that language. There's some quite good language analysis in this, but obviously they could have done more and they definitely could have included more theory again. OK, so moving on. This is uh, an overview, basically, of what the examiner is looking for and what they really want in the good essays. 
they definitely need you have an introduction. And that introduction needs to address the question and show an understanding of what you're going to go about. You know, how are you going to address that question? What are you going to say? Put that in your intro. They want you to name the set products they're being written about. And they definitely want you to give a clear explanation of the story that you're referring to. So when it talks about referring to a hard news event, they want you to name and explain that event. They want you to show your knowledge of the set texts and they also want you to um, use that to support the points that you're being made. You need to have a balance. So if you're looking at two stories, uh, two set texts, sorry, you need to make sure that you're referring to both of those equally so that you're really analysing, giving you a chance to um, explain your points across the two products. If the theory is requested by the question, make sure you definitely uh, address it. Obviously, make sure your conclusion goes back to your question and make sure it's an appropriate length for those 20 marks, making sure you cover enough points for 20 marks. So where do you go now? What can you do? Well, in order to prepare for the exam, look for those significant news events. Look for the things which are making the news on the different platforms that you're studying and on the set text that you've been looking at. Consider how those stories are presented across all the different forms that you've been looking at. Consider what the radio does, which is different to the way in which the newspaper and the website presents the news. Basically, keep paying attention to the news, looking at what's being presented to us and analysing how that's being presented. So thank you for coming along this evening. I hope this has given you some ideas that you're able to go away with and have a look at. So I'm hoping that you're now a little bit more confident about how to approach this section. I hope that you're able to find the answers for the questions and I hope that you're aware of what it is you need to do for the exam. So the mark scheme, the success criteria. So thank you very much for coming along this evening. And I hope you found it useful. It is recorded. You can go back and look at it again. And next week we're going to look at new uh, film in Wales and Hollywood. Thank you for coming. No staff.